Isso aí, vamos começar o conteúdo nos palcos todos. Aqui no palco principal, nós vamos ter uma palestra super bacana da Netflix. A gente tem aqui o Maxim Yevmenkin. Did I say that right? Yevmenkin? Close enough. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Maxim Yevmenkin, é, que é um Senior Software Engineer da Netflix. Eu sou fã da galera da Netflix, tá certo? Sou, sou usuário cliente, mas sou fã não por ser cliente. Sou fã porque esses caras estão usando uma infraestrutura de nuvem absolutamente sofisticada. São grandes usuários de Java. É, estão usando uma, 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 uma infraestrutura muito bacana na, na nuvem, tá certo? É, usando a Amazon. É, eles têm uns esquemas muito loucos de fazer desenvolvimento. Inclusive, ontem eu assisti uma palestra onde um dos caras falava assim, ah, os nossos sistemas são tão grandes que a gente não consegue testar mais. Né? Tá certo? Mas hoje em dia, não existe mais teste em ambiente de teste. Hoje em dia a gente testa em produção. Né? Aí o cara fala assim, pô, mas eu vou estragar a minha aplicação de produção? Cara, mas se a sua aplicação em produção não, não aguenta você testar ela, você acha que ela vai aguentar seus usuários? Né? Então, é, a Netflix faz exatamente isso. Inclusive, a Netflix tem um, um, um componente, tá certo? Que é o Chaos Monkey, que fica des desconectando máquinas, tá certo? Né? Pra, pra, pra poder fazer o teste. Então, os caras, assim, os caras tão, têm um ambiente bacana, maluco, de teste e tudo mais. E, mais legal ainda, eles liberaram um monte de coisa como open source. Então, se você quiser montar o mesmo ambiente da Netflix para montar a sua aplicação de cloud, eles colocaram tudo isso como open source, certo? Então, por conta disso, eu sou fã. A palestra do Maxim Yevmenkin. Maxim Yevmenkin, ele é engenheiro de software, sênior da Netflix, né? É, ele entrou na Netflix em 2011, foi um dos primeiros engenheiros a trabalhar com Open Connect CDN. É, ele tem muitas coautorias de patentes de CDN. Você é então, um cara que manja bastante CDN para estar aqui. Né? É, então, como eu falei, né, a Netflix tem mais de 40 milhões de assinantes no mundo todo. Uh, e por trás dessa revolução né, de transmitir vídeo, tá certo? É, eles têm uma sofisticada arquitetura de hardware e software Tá certo? que suporta a transmissão de 114 mil anos de vídeo por mês. Tá certo? Que é o que ele falou ali, né? 114 mil anos de vídeo por mês. Sem mais delongas, vou passar para o Maxim para ele falar sobre Netflix, tá certo? que acho que é uma coisa bacana que todo desenvolvedor devia estar assistindo. Com vocês, Netflix. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxim Yermiankin, and um, I'm going to be talking about Netflix Open Connect initiative. So this is the brief uh, outline of my presentation. First, I'm going to talk about what Netflix is and uh, for those of you who don't know what Netflix is. Uh, then I'm going to say, say a few words about myself and what do I do Netflix. Then we're going to talk about content. Obviously, uh, what is this so special about Netflix content and uh, typical characteristics of Netflix content. Uh, then uh, I'll describe Netflix streaming components, what, what it is the Netflix streaming is made of and how it works behind. And after that we will talk about Open Connect Network and Open Connect Appliance. Finally, uh, I'm going to talk about Netflix and open source. Netflix Brazil, and at the end, we will uh, have que questions and answer sessions. Okay. So, what is Netflix? I'm sure most of you know what Netflix really is. 
But just to reiterate, so Netflix is a global company, and Netflix has 40 million subscribers worldwide. It's a service that uh, allows you unlimited on-demand global internet streaming. Uh, we do have a large streaming content library and we continuously keep adding new titles to the library so you get more and more available content every day. And it's not just movies, it's uh, television series, documentaries, uh, animation, things, and as well Netflix producing its own original content as well. And it's also a very fun place to work at. <laughs> and this is a bit of a Netflix lifestyle for you. It doesn't really matter if you are enjoying, you know, relaxing by yourself or you're spending time with your friends, whether you're traveling or on your way to work. Netflix is always available to you on one of the uh, mobile devices or you know wired devices practically any interface that ha any device that has a screen and has online connectivity will likely to have a Netflix client for it, for it so who I am and what do I do exactly for the Netflix uh, I'm a senior software engineer in Netflix Netflix I've been with the company a little over two years since 2011. Before joining Netflix, I worked in content delivery space for over 10 years. Uh, and I was involved in developing software for various content delivery network solutions. Uh, I am also an open source developer and I've been with open source communities since 2003 and I've been participating in a numerous open source projects and some of those I'm, I'm very familiar with FreeBSD, Linux and other open source Unix operating system and, and various open source projects as well. Now let's talk about Netflix content, what it is, uh, how is it encoded and what it looks like and what the typical characteristics of the Netflix content. So we do have separate audio and video streams. They're, pro they're basically completely separate m media files, if you will. We also have a separate bitrate encoding and different encodings. That is, uh, if you change resolution or if you change the format of the streaming, we will likely to have, uh, we will have different media file for that. And the reason for that is because not all devices are capable of playing all media formats. So we do have to have some variety here and we do have to have different encodings depending on what the particular device can play. All our content is static. We do not perform transcoding on the fly. We basically know what device is it is and we know which stream present to the device. We have, like I mentioned, we have a very large library and now each particular title in the library can be encoded in a variety of ways so the opportunities for caching of this content and reusing this encoding, uh, re encodings, different encodings are very limited. And that it basically makes it challenging to come up with the good working caching solution. Therefore, things like uh, transparent proxy and transparent caching solution do not work with Netflix very well for this very reason. Library is over petabyte currently and it continuously, continuously growing. 
we keep we adding new content daily. And the main characteristic of our content is long tail popularity distribution. So what it means is that we have a very, very popular content that is likely to be watched by majority of Netflix users and it constitutes about 70 to 80 percent of Netflix users. And it's a relatively small amount of content, but in order to get to 100 percent of uh, cash efficiency, we would have to increase the amount by a lot. So we do have this very, very popular content in the beginning, and the tail is just very, very long. One thing I have to mention here is that uh, the popular content is not static. You absolutely cannot just cache this particular title and or this particular set of titles and be done with that because content goes in and out of uh, popularity. Basically, imagine a scenario when you have a new release or new, new season of popular television series. So obviously the new episodes will be more popular and they will be, will be moved up into popularity ranking. So we would have to recalculate and change our distribution, how, how we cache content. So that's another challenge to coming up with a good working caching solution. Now that we described uh, Netflix content and what makes it so unique, let's talk about Netflix streaming components. So obviously we have Netflix ready devices or clients. Those are the devices that actually show content, right? These are devices with screen and user interface and the one that you use to actually watch the movies or television series or whatever that you want to watch. Then we have uh, Amazon Web Services, which we use to run command and control, monitoring and reporting, website, business logic, customer authentication, etc., as well as data sciences and encoding and encrypting of the content. I'm going to talk about the website, business logic, and customer authentication, as well as data sciences and encoding and encryption. Instead, we're going to focus on comment and control and monitoring and report it a little bit later. And final piece of uh, component, final component of the Netflix streaming is actual content delivery. And what are we going to talk about? It's two things. One is what we call an open connect network and how ISPs can participate in open connect network to enhance user experience, Netflix user experience. And then we're going to talk about the Open Connect appliance, which is the individual nodes on the Open Connect network, the actual hardware and software that is used to deliver bits to end users, to deliver the streams to end users. So what are Netflix ready devices or clients? Uh, obviously, it's, we have a web browser based players. And this is very simple. You go fire up your internet browser, you go to Netflix website and you start watching movie or television series right there and then inside your computer. So this is very nice of course, but we'll take it, we take it step beyond that. We have Netflix clients for game consoles now and uh, it includes game consoles from Microsoft, all the Xboxes, uh, the game consoles from Nintendo, the Wii U and DS consoles, as well as game consoles from Sony, so all the PlayStation, which uh, we own Netflix client running on uh, smartphones and tablets, running Android, iOS, 
Kindle Fire, Nuke, and Windows Phone, all of those devices have Netflix client available. That's not all. Now, with advance of smart TV and smart blue lay players, we have clients that actually run inside your television and inside your smart Blu-ray player. And every single major electronic manufacturer now they'll provide a television or Blu-ray player with Netflix clients running on it. And that's not all as well. Uh, we also have a set of clients for the set-top boxes. Set-top boxes include Apple TV, Google Chromecast, a relatively new device, set-top box from Roku, TiVo, and many, many others. And the list goes on and on, and uh, I am not going to mention all of the devices in here, but I can say that next time you're shopping for a device and you're interested in watching Netflix, just look for the Netflix logo. And finally, we obviously looking forward to your Netflix device. And uh, if you come up with a better suggestion, do please let us know. We would welcome it. So get inspired and get creative. So what are the typical characteristics of Netflix-ready devices? So all the Netflix-ready devices use real-time streaming and they use HTTP for delivery. Usually there is a small amount of buffering uh, available, but none of the devices will ever cache the entire stream locally. So you're never going to see that. Depending on the client, you might get from a few seconds to a few minutes of buffering, but uh, it's not enough to cache, to cache the entire, to load the entire movie in memory. I already mentioned that we do have a separate streams for audio and video, and that clients has maintained separate streams for audio and video. All cloud clients support, support an adaptive bitrate switching, which basically means client continuously monitors your user experience and your network condition and should your system become slow or networks become congested, the client will automatically try to adjust and switch to our lower bitrate or as condition improve, it will try to go ahead and switch to a higher bitrate. And this process goes continuously and it, it evaluates in background and most of the time switch switch happens seamlessly and user does not even notice this. Netflix uh, clients also can stream the same title from multiple locations. And during the playback, if one of the locations become unresponsive or something were to happen to it uh, or it crashed or something, Netflix clients can automatically switch to a different location and continue stream from there. Again, in most cases, the switching happens, happens seamlessly and users don't even know that it is happening. The new relatively new feature is the parallel streaming is basically when client can open multiple TCP streams to a source and could stream the data using this multiple TCP connection which improves quality and allows us to work around on congested networks because we have more chances to pass packets from source to the client. So finally, all Netflix devices do collect information about user experience and report that back. We use this information again to analyze how good your experience was and to control our algorithms and fine-tune our algorithms. So let's talk about the next component of 
Netflix streaming, and this is command, the con command and control. So this is the brain of the entire system. This is where all the decision making happens. And uh, Netflix here is a unique position where it controls both sides of the equation. It controls clients, and it can so destination, and it controls servers. That is server, uh, which is uh, uh, which is source. So, commenting control is basically runs in the cloud. We use Amazon Web Services cloud. It's built around Netflix open source framework. Uh, we use HTTPS as the transport protocol to make sure all the information is secure. Uh, it's used. It's based around REST type API, which basically means it's stateless and it's very simple and fault tolerant. It also resilient to errors and crashes. We use technologies such as elastic load balancing. We run multiple instances of the command and control in, uh, software behind the elastic load balancers. And we also use multiple zones, depending on the geographical region you come in from. And sometimes DNS, the resolution name resolution service, could direct you to the wrong zone, in which case the system automatically detects it and redirects redirect you back to the correct zone where you're supposed to be. So what are the main functions of command and control? So one thing is it determines what content should actually be present on the network. In other words, is what titles are available to users to watch. And the way we build the this, distribute this content across the network is we generate the list of what titles should be on each particular appliance, an individual node in the system. And we take into account available capacity, storage capacity on each node, on each appliance. We take into account the global popularity feed because we know what users are watching and we can say that this particular title is more popular than the other one, therefore, it's likely to be watched over and over again, and it makes sense to move it on the Open Connect network or move it closer to the users. We also know which content is available by region because when we acquire content, it obviously comes with restriction whether or not we can, sh we can show this particular title and this particular region. And in large deployment, when we do have a number of appliances installed in a single place, and it makes sense to cache more than uh, what a bigger library, then we generate a, what we call a sharding, where we able to cache a library that is bigger than the storage capacity of one node. And in order to avoid a point of single point of failure, should one appliance fail, we're not losing any content, we put multiple copies on the different appliance. For example, we might have a cluster of, let's say, 10 appliances, and the same title will exist on three out of 10. So we have a triple redundancy here. So the next function of command and control is tracking of what is actually present on the network. So the first part is basically tells us, OK, we would like to have this out on the network. However, it takes some time for the content to propagate through the entire network. And each appliance is going to work its way through the list and download missing files and put them on the, on the hard disks and everything. And then eventually, it's going to report back and say, yes, I have this, this the files, or no, I still don't have them. So that goes back to, again, to command and control, where we track content available on each appliance. The amount of storage used per each appliance. 
And like I said, each appliance would periodically report back what it has. And another piece, another function of command and control is configuration management, where we obviously provide the configurations for each appliance and settings for each appliance and as a global. So another thing is command and control does is direct and content serving. And that is how clients get directed to a particular caching appliance. And again, the algorithm takes into account what is available on each uh, appliance. It takes into account network restrictions, uh, whether or not it, certain clients from the certain net blocks are allowed to buy a certain appliance. It takes into account geogra geographic restrictions. It takes into account appliance health, whether or not is client to likely receive a good service from this particular appliance or not, because it's busy or because it's sick. And obviously, it can generate a list of multiple choices for clients, so the client can switch away between those, between those different uh, sources, between different appliances, and select which one works best. Command and control also direct content filling. And content filling is actually how content gets on each individual node. And the appliances, they can cross fill from each other. So again, we take into account what's available where. We take into account health. We implement business logic where we can stay stage a uh, or filling of appliances, so not every single appliance on the network goes to the same place at once to, to avoid uh, overloading the links. And again, it can generate multiple fill sources, so when appliance is looking for places to fill, it can go try all the different ways and finally find where to fill from. And finally, command and control also provides software update for appliances. The next component is monitoring and reporting, and that's another subsystem that runs in the cloud and it runs on AWS. Another subsystem that is built around Netflix open source frameworks. And it's a high available system. It's very scalable and it uses cloud storage solution. It uses Amazon S3 storage. It uses Hive, Hadoop, and Cassandra, all of those technologies. So what are the functions of monitoring and reporting? It, like it says, it collects and storing data from the network. So two things here is one, it's what the client re report back to the, to, this, to the brain, so to speak, to the center. And the most important thing here is we calculate what they call the time-weighted bitrate and rebuffers. Those are the two indicators that tell us how good your experience was. We basically monitor, each client monitors, is average bitrate of the stream being delivered from the network. As, and as I mentioned, client can switch the bitrate, so as the network becomes congested, client will switch to a lower bitrate, so your time-weighted bitrate is gonna go lower and then we'll know that the something is up. Finally, when your network can go so bad that it's absolutely not able to sustain stream, even if, if, and if the lowest bitrate available, what happens is rebuffering. And this is a really bad experience for user because what happens is your stream get interrupted, you get stuck in the middle and you get spinning thing, it basically says, okay, I'm buffering data from the network. Uh, I'm sure we all seen this and it's very, very bad. It's so they reduce the amount of rebuffers and basically keep the amount, keep the time where the bitrate high is, is the two parameters that we use, we optimize for and so we know the client get better, good experience, good viewing experience. So each appliance also reports data back to the, 
to the monitoring and reporting system. And it reports data from the operating system. So how operating system is doing? Do we think the operating system is busy? Do we think that the operating system is doing a good job at serving the clients? How many TCP connections do we have open? How many operations, you know, disk reads per second are we doing? All of those sort of little things we report back so we can tell how is appliance is doing, how an individual node on the network is doing. We also report metrics from our application that runs on the appliance. We know how many bits we surf out. We know which devices are requesting the data, where a device, all of this, where device is coming from, all of that information gets back and stored. And it's all stored in the centralized global storage, which is accessible for all other subsystems. So monitoring and reporting obviously monitors the health of the, of the entire network. Each appliance is going to periodically submit its health report so we know how well it is doing. So we can tell that this particular appliance is not doing so well. We're going to try and avoid sending clients here. It also alerts on health metrics. If something, if something goes wrong and we think the system is not healthy, we raise an alert and operational personnel is aware of that and we can take a look and either take the appliance offline or work around the problem. And finally, we also use that system to produce the graphs. And this is the nice way to visualize the data and system is doing overall. Now, let's talk about Open Connect Network and what it really is and how ISPs can participate in Open Connect Network. So there's three main, three ways one can participate in Open Connect Network. The first way is embedding Open Connect appliance in your local network. The second way is to have private interconnect with us in one of them peering locations. And finally, you can public peer with Netflix. Netflix has an open peering policy. And a diagram below shows you basically how it's all stacked up. So on the left, you see a client and uh, ISP's local network and embedded Open Connect appliance, which is very, very close. It's inside the ISP network. Then one step up, you have uh, Internet Exchange appliance. And the next tier up is what we call an origin Open Connect appliance. And that's basically a set of appliances that you use to cache the entire library. It's the main, it's the first tier of where all the content gets into the network. And obviously, encoding happens in the cloud, Amazon, AWS, AWS and S3, where the source files are being put and then get distributed to the origin OCA. So let's talk about the ways one can participate and what's good or bad about them. So obviously, the best way to participate in Open Connect Network is to embed cache within your local network. So if you choose to go this route, you will get a free dedicated appliance or potentially multiple appliances, depending on how much Netflix traffic you have. It's going to be sitting on your network. It's going to require very little maintenance, almost none. And it's going to be very close to your customers. So your customers are going to receive a very good experience. It also will provide an offload of your uplink because all of that Netflix traffic is not going to cross your uplink. So your uplink becomes less congested and it's good. In some cases, embedding is not an option. So the next best way is to private interconnect in one of the internet exchange centers. Netflix does have presence in all major interconnect and shade changes in Brazil. So what it gives to you is 
appliance um, or potentially multiple appliances. You don't get the dedicated appliance because in an internet exchange, cent internet exchange center, other carriers might be, other customers might be using exactly the same appliance. And you obviously need a port on the, your router to interconnect. And finally, if that is not even an option, you could use public peering. And this is, this is the worst of three, because not only you get shared appliance, which shared with everyone else, you're also using a public internet for delivery, and this is the far, potentially the far, far away from your customers. So every Netflix traffic, any Netflix traffic would have to cross a long distance. So your latencies will in, in, increase and your customers will likely to get bad Netflix experience. And uh, just so I'm not you know, saying all this without any proof, there's some slide about since we started embedding in South America, it's particularly in Brazil, which is the largest country in, in South America, it can definitely benefit from the distributed topology. Appliances, which we can put in key cities, can reach nearby cities and serve many customers. Netflix is working very, very closely with local ISPs. Netflix conduct technical interviews. We suggest an optimized network topology. We offer help with your deployment. We help with configuration. And what does it, what we see is we see significant improvements in time-weighted bitrate, and we see reduction in rebuffers. If you recall, I was talking about those two metrics that allows us to sell how good your Netflix experience is. So now let's talk about Open Connect Appliance. And this is the actual hardware that we use to deliver bits, to deliver streams to users. Each appliance is designed to operate completely independently. Uh, it, it doesn't assume that there is other appliances around. It just, it just thinks it's on its own. It's, that's it. However, command and, command and control have an abstraction where it can group appliances. And two examples of such grouping is content clusters. Like I said, when we have a, a deployment that can cache more than one uh, when, when the storage capacity of one appliance, we can split the entire library and kind of put the chunks of each library on multiple uh, appliances. And we also have concept of route clusters, where we can collect a route or a list of prefixes from ISP that are uh, allowed to be served from those particular appliances, and we can apply those across multiple appliances. So it's what we call route clusters. Open Connect appliance it basically serves, answers requests from clients and other appliances. So the clients, obviously, it's the view viewing request that I want to stream movie, and requests from the other appliances is, is how you feel content. The each appliance is, is basically cache, web cache. So it also removes, it, it uh, removes the files that it was told to remove because command and control analyzed the data and it said some of the files that you have are no longer required because they're not popular anymore or it fell out of window of uh, restrictions and whatever it is reason basically it shouldn't be on on, on the network anymore it downloads new files that are required and it puts it on a local storage as well it also can listen to BGP updates. It can talk BGP to obtain the list of prefixes from the local ISPs that tell us which clients are allowed to be served by this appliance. It communicates with command and control that runs on Amazon Cloud, and it also supports IPv6. Each 
each network, each Open Connect appliance is highly optimized to stream network con content. It can hold around half a million files per single appliance. We use multiple directly attached disks and we use a separate file system per each disk. We do not use any RAID solution. It's fail in place system. The appliance can support between five and 20,000 concurrent TCP connections. And we achieve that by tuning operating system and by tuning TCP stacks on each appliance. Each appliance can support between three to 500 of clients per each disk. And uh, we achieve that by using technologies such as synchronous disk I.O. and technology called zero copy to network, which allows us to transfer data directly from the plate to the network without copying the data to the user space and back. So what it is physically, what sort of hardware it is. We run through three iterations of hardware currently. And the first revision of the hardware is revision A, was designed to support, to serve 10 gigabytes of, 10 gigabits of traffic per single appliance. It was built out of off-the-shelf PC components, something that you can find on the internet or in the computer store. It's the Super Micro motherboard, the four-core Intel CPU process, 32 gigabyte of RAM. It has an Intel 10 gigabit network card with two ports. We do support link aggregation. The only thing that's custom about the appliance is the chassis, and this is a 4U ISP-friendly chassis. Each appliance has a 36 directly attached SATA drives, and those are spinning drives. Plus, it has two solid state drives which I use as a boot media. And what does it look like? It looks like this. So it's a big and uh, red and uh, it's very, very loud. And this is the Netflix traffic graph as of August 2012. So you can see the red line is what we serve and the blue line is what we fill. And uh, Netflix, you can see Netflix traffic is very, you know, it has a very distinctive pattern. As the evening approaches, more and more people start watching things, so more and more and more comes into appliance. And you can see here appliance serving 10 gigabytes of traffic at peak. And uh, it fills around six every night as well. So we actually did have a revision B of hardware, hardware, but it never left the lab. So we've moved straight to revision C of hardware, and which is what we currently have in production. And this appliance is designed to serve 20 gigabits of traffic, so double the traffic throughput. Still uses the off-the-shelf PC components, still uses the same super microboard, motherboard. We double the amount of CPU cores, we double the amount of RAM, and we switch from Intel to Chelsea NIC. Now we do have four 10 gigabit ports. Again, we do support link aggregation. And again, we use custom chassis. We did increase the size of each spinning drive to four terabytes. And we added four more solid state drives. So we now have a total of six solid state drives. And we increased the size of them as well to one terabyte. And that is what it looks like. This is what we currently have in production. And this is what cluster of those appliances look like. So this is another graph that shows traffic. And you can see a green, red, and blue shades. This is per link. So we can tell we use three links out of four. And with total capacity, total aggregate throughput of 16 gigabit per second, and then later it jumps to 20 gigabit per second. So finally, we do have one more revision of the hardware, revision D, which we only deploy in a large 
uh, installations. It only makes sense to have those appliances in the in the internet exchange change centers where the amount of traffic is is basically big. And this is effectively as it's very similar to the Revision C hardware, with the exception that we replaced the disk subsystem with all SSDs. It's there is no spinning drives in the in the in its system, only solid state drives. It's 14 solid state drives and it's one terabyte drives. This appliance doesn't really make sense to have by itself. It only makes sense to deploy it in the clusters where we have enough, otherwise we won't get capacity. And this is what the clusters of those look like. We usually typically deploy 30 to 40 of those appliances in each location. So now let's talk about Netflix and open source. Netflix is a big supporter of open source. And uh, whatever we do, we always try to be open about our software and hardware. So I invite you to check out the following links and see what Netflix is up to. So first of all, the Netflix Open Source Software Center is where all the frameworks and all the tools that we use are open sourced. We use FreeBSD as our operating system of choice. We use Nginx as, as the web server that actually serves, delivers the bid. And we use BERT as PGP listener. We do use some other open source projects as well, but those are the main ones. So why we have selected FreeBSD? The first reason is licensing. So FreeBSD has a BSD style licensing, which is very friendly towards vendor. Uh, FreeBSD usually have a good vendor support. FreeBSD has a very good open source development community and with active developers. One of the important things to us is ability to influence direction of the development. As a vendor, we are interested in having certain features being prioritized, prioritized and getting into the next version of operating system. So with FreeBSD, we can able, be able to do that. And as important thing for us that if we do find a bug in the operating system or if we do make the change to the operating system and we open source it, we actually want to see this in the next release of the operating system. It allows us to reduce our local patch set against uh, the operating system and uh, we don't have to maintain anymore and we benefit from the larger testing and deployment. Another thing is FreeBSD has a very good integration of kernel and user land. It does come from the single source repository to get everything in one sweep. You don't have to hunt down all the kernel parts or the user, sp user space parts. It's all in the same thing. And finally, we do have a good experts on FreeBSD. People who tend to work on FreeBSD tend to work for, on it for a very long time so they know what they're doing. So why we have selected Nginx as our web server of choice? Again, licensing, it's not GPL. It's it can be BSD style licensing, which is very friendly to vendors. Nginx has a very good vendor support, and again, it has a very good open source community. Nginx is relatively lightweight. It doesn't use a lot of resources to, to do its work. It's high performing, and it uses modern architecture and API. It uses the asynchronous KQ, all of that send file, all of that good stuff that allows us to actually focus on what needs to be done, and that is pushing data out on the network and not wasting time doing other stuff. And finally, it's very, very flexible and, and expandable. We can write our own custom modules and extend Nginx in any way that we like. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about improvements that we've done for FreeBSD. And this is, might become very technical, so bear with me for a little while. So first improvements we've done, we improved link aggregation in FreeBSD. We've added uh, handling of heartbeat loss. We added some extra metrics, and we added some test knobs that we can pull. We also switched from the reader writer logs to read mostly logs, which improve concurrency and throughput as well. 
they fixed the numerous bugs you would get an instant panic and uh, it was a ref count flex we fixed that one of the major improvements was the unmapped IO and this is the interaction and collaboration with Isilon and FreeBSD Foundation and that allows us to basically reduce TLB trashing and reduce the kernel VM pressure. Another improvement is for Intel network card driver. As it turns out, the, the, the workload is, is where we actually send a lot of traffic out, but we're not receiving anything back. Well, we do receive only TCP acts. And those are very, very small packets. And for those, it didn't make any sense to allocate the full packet and go you know, to memory allocator for that. Instead, we could just in use the MBUFs and copy 120 bytes into there and just use that, send that up the stack. That saves us a lot of CPU. So we also added a VFS readme knob. And the idea here was to combine two I.O. So traditional BSD I.O. subsystem would issue two requests. One is for the amount of data you actually requested. And second one is the amount of pre-read of data because operating system is actually going to assume that you're going to be reading the next chunk of data. You're going to be needing a chunk of data. And, uh, we combined, we added this knob that allows us to combine this two I.O. at one, in, into one I.O. And the result is that we achieve exactly the same through single disk, but we, we effectively halved amount of disk I.O. So disks are becoming now less stressed and we can put more clients on them. We fixed a bug in flow table that had an inefficient scan, an N squared scan in there, and it was eating CPU as well. We introduced the new API for their kernel sockets, it's called SB cut, and that allows us to reduce log con contention on socket buffers as well, eliminating congestion points within the kernel, and again, reducing CPU usage. Finally, we implement a uh, multi-trading soft, soft depths. Uh, soft dep soft dep soft dep is uh, a facility for FreeBSD UFS file system that allows to effectively buffer metadata updates such as remove the file directories and then flush them into the single uh, transaction to disk. Again, to improve disk performance and to improve disk responsiveness. So as it turns out, the original implementation was a single threaded, and if you have a lot of updates, your queue becomes too long and it takes a while. So we paralyze work here by introducing multiple threads. Again, less contention, less CPU usage, the data flows more freely from, from disk to network. What are the next uh, improvements that we are going to make in FreeBSD? And that's uh, send file improvement. Send file is the API that allows you to basically send data from the network, from this disk, sorry, to the network by completely bypassing user space. So there is no copying of data involved. So this is the zero copy operation. So they going to do is to make this fully synchronous and we provide them more control from the application. We're going to work on the latency sens sensitive IO scheduling. And the idea here is being that if disk is overloaded, sometimes it's better to back off a little bit and let disk recover rather than slam it with more and more requests and let disks fall behind. So it's kind of like a traffic congestion. I mean, sometimes you just take few out cars out of the road and everything works nice. But if you put even more cars on the road, the traffic congestion becomes bad. Same idea here. And we're going to parallelize the pass to disk even more by introducing multi queuing for the host bus adapters. So those are the cards that actually uh, talk to the drives and self. So we're going to implement a multiple queue support here. 
And finally, big area research for us is the TCP congestion algorithms. When more and more traffic, we encounter problems with congested network, and we realize that traditional TCP con congestion algorithms do not work very well. So we clearly need uh, some make some improvements here as well. So Netflix, this is the pie chart that shows the amount of traffic just the traffic distribution for the North America and in first half of 2013. As you can see, almost one third of entire internet traffic in North America is Netflix. So we're bigger than YouTube, BitTorrent, HTTP traffic, we're bigger than everything. We effectively own a one third of the North American internet. So that's how much bits we push out. So finally, uh, let me introduce the Netflix Brazil point of contact, Mr. Flavio Amaral, right here. If you have any question about embedding or peering in Brazil, please send him a mail, please contact him directly. He will be happy to help you. So with that, uh, I'm opening question, question and answers. Yes. Hadoop is for analyzing, making query to the database, right? So we do have, like I said, distributed data storage where we save a lot of data. So Hadoop here is used to paralyze and making order to ask and making those jobs. So this is like a data sciences uh, analysis of data, uh, making all those queries. So it runs in again, it runs in Amazon Cloud. It parts. It comes with Amazon Cloud. So we do get. So we can effectively use resources and crunch the large amount of data and come up with reports. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hi there. Uh, you said in the beginning of your presentation that you you separate the audio from the video. Uh, uh -huh. I, I got curious about that because. How, how do you manage to, to keep the video synced? Is it on the back end, on the front end? And uh, another question is, how many versions for, for a single movie or a, a series Siri episode you have on, on your server? Right, so uh, the appliance, the server itself, is completely unaware of what's inside the files it's serving. So all the synchronization is done on the client side. and. Uh, even more, the files that we actually put on the appliance, they're all completely encrypted and encoded. So even if you were to somehow download those files, it wouldn't even make any sense to you. So the, it's the client that basically obtains the keys for the content, downloads the, starts streaming the content of the network, decrypts it, and takes care of the synchronization and the whole thing, I guess. As far as how many variations, it really depends, right? Um, with, with video, there is an audio, there's some overlap. We can reuse uh, encoding, like if you use AUG, for example, we can use multiple devices, can play with AUG or use MPF, uh, H263 encoder, that sort of thing. But uh, you would typically have you know, a handful of what we call profiles, and it's an order of, an order of 10. So there would be a ten, around 10 different encodings of each particular title for various type of devices. Uh, Netflix support many devices, right? Uh, why not support Linux? And why use Microsoft Silverlight and not HTML5 or other, another Moody platform alternative? Well, uh, the first question, why not support Linux? We do support Linux in a sense, because 
if you look at the smart TV and the blue light players, under the hood they usually do run of Linux. So Netflix runs on them. That's that's one thing. So and why as far as the why use Microsoft Serverlite? Because Microsoft Serverlite was a I guess a very platform. But we do have HTML5 version of the player in the works and, and Silverlight I believe is actually might be either be phased out or just being put on life support, whatever that is. I heard you, Netflix is going to streaming 4K, and I want to know if that's going to change something in terms of software. No, it's not going to change anything at all, because like I said, the appliance is actually not aware of what's inside the files that it is actually serving. So the architecture doesn't change. What will change is client support, right? So the client will be able to, be able to download well, what we like to change the size of the files will increase because obviously it's more bits and some more more encoding. And uh, but the entire architecture is will remain exactly the same. Um, you said that you. É, você disse que é, vocês adotaram o FreeBSD né, e o NGINX por causa da licença. Eu queria saber qual que é o problema do GPL para vocês. Because we operate appliance and we actually give appliance in to the third parties. And we affect the model in such that we release control of the appliance. So if we were to make any change with JPL, we would have to distribute the entire source code and uh, it's just become unmanageable at some point. I mean, we Netflix is very open about this and all the work we do, we do com commit, contribute to the source point, but that has to do more with the way they manage the actual hardware and the relationship between, between the ISPs, the people who accept hardware and and Netflix. That's that's the only thing. It's just because we not operate, we don't make a service. We don't do we do we don't do a server as a as a. We don't operate servers. We give a box which we give to you. So we bas you basically own the box. And and GPL is is restrictive in a way. So it says if we make any change, we we are required to give you a copy of source code. Or if you were to open a box somehow and, and say, hey, you guys may change this particular package and why not, why are you not giving the source? It's, it's purely for that reason. For, for the hardware, you show several versions of hardware that you have developed, right? Mm -hmm. So why develop your own uh, appliance servers instead of uh, having whatever, HP, IBM, Dell, uh, ready-made servers? Storage density. Storage density. You don't, there is not an, uh, well, any price, obviously, right? Uh, everything that you, the big brand names servers, they would cost more. And you don't get that, that storage capacity. We currently have an appliance that has over 100 terabytes of storage. I am not aware of any server with such a, you know, capacity. And any reason for not using the storage devices itself? Uh, well, I mean, storage is the one thing we need to store it, obviously, right? But we cannot buy a filer from that app because it becomes ridiculously expensive, right? So it has to be, think of it as a really, really big web server. That's effectively what it is. And it has to be cost efficient, and it has to be simple, and if it were to fail, right, then we operate it to a mode until it failed completely. We run it to the ground, and then we just send you a new one and take the old one back. Make sense? Okay.
Right. Thank you very much.